Peterson second. Thank you. We have we have a motion and a second. Don, would you please call a roll with regard to the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montplaisir. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Item number three is the approval of the bills. They have been distributed. Uh, call on Mr. Costin, please. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, total bills to be approved, 10,566,816 as listed here. Primary uh, largest payer of the Cass Joint Water District, mostly for land acquisitions. Um, some reimbursements to the stakeholder entities are also on the list uh, as presented. So that'd be the extent of my report. Thank you, Mr. Costin. Are there any questions of Mr. Costin? Chair, to entertain a motion, please, for approval. Steen moves to approve. Thank you. Is there a second, please? Peterson second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the bills as presented by Mr. Costin and as distributed. Don, would you please take the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montplaisir. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Next order of business is a financial report. Again, we call on Mr. Costin. Uh, so on page 24, as presented here, the uh, 2020 spend for the calendar year is $68,207,571. A large portion of that being land acquisitions in North Dakota. And the cumulative spend for the project to date is $602,885,091. Um, if you move on to the statement of net position on page 25, uh, our net position has gone up uh, $119,467,242. I wanted to comment briefly on the State Water Commission. Uh, that number is much larger than normal, um, and that includes $36 million that has been turned in as a result of uh, the allowance of administrative costs by the State Water Commission uh, in recent modifications of their funding. So we've turned in $36 million of past expenditures that will be reimbursed and returned to our treasury by the end of December. We've had a dialogue with some of their staff people and they feel as though we will be paid by the end of the year. Then there's an additional $8 million in there for November. So if anybody's wondering why that number is so large, that would be the explanation for that. Um, Continuing on, uh, the other reports are listed there, the cash budget report. There's no real big issues there. We're well under budget. And all of the other reports that are typically listed there are included. And uh, if you go to page 40, um, I wanted to just make a note of something at this point. Page 40, please. It'll be just one second. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll just talk through that. The, the state fund balances remaining based upon what's been appropriate at this point is uh, about 36 million. So we, we do have some spend down and uh, the anticipated appropriations for the, um, for the session in the 44 million in the 22.5 and the 66.5 are all kind of teed up uh, into the future here. Um, so, um, as we continue, the state legislature will obviously be making decisions on our funding. So I just want to point that out. That's that balance has dropped primarily because of the uh, recoupment of the uh, 
administrative expenses that's included in payment 109 listed there about where the cursor is. So that would be the explanation there. I didn't have any further comments. Thank you, Mr. Costin. Are there any questions of Mr. Costin? Steen has a question. Please, Mr. Steen. Back on page 26, and this is probably a question more for Mike Monplazier. I'm just looking at the year to date um, collections or revenue sources in Cass County is about 5,000 behind where we need to be at the end of the year or expected to be at the end of the year. Any comments on that, Mike? Is that purely timing or where are we at with that? You mean it's less than what we budgeted? Yeah, I'm looking at the 2020 approved budget of 16724 and we're currently at 11592 with a month to go. Well, the budget figure is simply the budget figure. Um, I get that. Kent, are you? Yeah, let me help you out with that, Mike. Um, I think we receive these on a cash basis. And so through November, we wouldn't have received that, um, the payment. There may be a, just a one month delay in payments uh, received from the county. Mike, I think it's uh, primarily a timing difference. Our, our sales tax resources are trending at about a 2 to 2.2% increase. So I believe it's just a timing difference. Yep. And I recognize that, and that's why it's a little bit uh, surprised we were down $5 million from budget because I think we've been trending over last year, if I'm not mistaken. So I just want to yeah. bring that up. Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Thank you, Mr. Costin, for your uh, review and, and Mr. Mon pleasure. Are there any further questions of the financial report? John, if you'd please call the roll for approval of the financial report as distributed and as explained. Mayor Dirtis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montplaisier. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Item number five is the Executive Director Financial Report. Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Chairman Dardis and members of the committee. I'll just be brief because I know we have a large agenda here. Um, similar to the last few months, uh, you know, we're tracking significantly under budget uh, for 2020. Um, no budget area concerns whatsoever. As you can see here in the tier one or level one summary, uh, we're well below our anticipated spend in all major categories. Um, again, the largest categories being the lands uh, program, uh, engineering, legal and financial, um, and the P3 support services. Uh, also to note, uh, City of Fargo, um, in town uh, budget is significantly below. Um, we do anticipate that to um, most of that work to be transferred over into the 2021 cash budget. We can talk about that later in the meeting, um, but really no concerns overall. Um, I think that's all that probably needs to be said at this point, Chairman, and in, in an effort to move the meeting along. Um, I'll take any questions, uh, but I won't go into any more depth than that. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Any questions for Mr. Paulson? Item number six is the contracting actions. Uh, Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two contracting actions for consideration and recommendation to the DA board uh, for the Finance Committee. Um, I'll explain both of them. Um, you can take them both as a vote or take in individual as you as you please. Uh, the first one is a scope of work number five, amendment two uh, for P3 RFP support for Ernst & Young infrastructure advisors. Ernst & Young is our financial um, planning consultant. Uh, they've been working with us through the duration of the P3 procurement. Uh, they are requesting an additional million dollars to their um, contract task order. 
Um, this is due to the slowdown and delay in the procurement process. Um, as we move forward, um, it, it is necessary to keep them involved through the execution of the um, uh, P3 agreement. Uh, and so I, I am recommending uh, consideration of support on, on that amendment. Uh, I do have John Shockley on the line. He can take any in-depth questions. Uh, John is the principal point of contact for Ernst & Young uh, for the P3 support. Uh, the second item is Task Order 2, Amendment 0, Phase 2, Flowage Easement. This is uh, to kick off Crown, Crown Appraisal's um, effort to um, execute and uh, the flowage easements for the upstream mitigation area. Uh, this is something that we've uh, really been looking forward to kicking off. Uh, I know landowners in the upstream area have been asking questions about flowage easements for years. Uh, this is going to be able to answer those questions and ultimately uh, begin negotiations with landowners um, to get those flow easements into place. Um, and uh, so with that, I'll take any questions related to either one of those. Well, we'll, we'll start with the Ernst & Young Infrastructure Advisors and uh, that amendment. Uh, are there any questions of Mr. Shockley or Mr. Paulson on that item? Moving on to Crown Appraisals, are there any questions for Mr. Paulson with regard to Crown Appraisals and the flow easements? All right, uh, the Chair would entertain a motion to cover both of these items. Mrs. Hendrickson, so moved. Thank you, Chuck. Is there a second, please? Dean to second. Yes, Thank you. And moved and second to approve the uh, Ernst & Young Infrastructure Advisor Amendment 2 and Crown Appraisal Amendment. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. Don, would you please take the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Costin? Yes. Mr. Montpleasure? Yes. Mr. Redlinger? Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Ms. McCall? Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. As you can see, uh, the next three items, there is nothing to report. So we'll move on to other business. Item number seven, the 2021 cash budget. Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the committee had a preview um, two months ago on the draft cash budget. Uh, we've since uh, put that on hold and revised it and we're bringing back a, a revised budget. Uh, we went from 178 million to 219 million. Um, a number of reasons for that, one being a uh, the setup of the economic relief fund um, as part of the um, upstream JPA settlement agreement. Uh, that uh, initial relief fund payment of 35 million has been included under other mitigation projects, uh, which brings that budget item up to 39.6 million. Uh, the other additional dollars uh, came into play for um, the transfer, transfer of uh, lands and the anticipated schedule of when those would hit. Um, and you can see we have uh, increased that budget to 69 million uh, for next year. Uh, so with that said, I, I think that those were the only substantial differences between the cash budget before as presented and the cash budget today. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go through uh, a little bit more detail here um, uh, under a, the level two detail. Uh, you can see that the management legal financial procurement uh, budget is uh, substantially higher than it's ever been. Um, this is related really to the procurement um, of the, uh, of the um, P3 developer, as well as a number of utility relocations that are necessary. And you'll see later in the meeting, uh, Mr. Shockley will present um, a large number of utility MOUs that are being asked to be executed this month 
those utility MOUs and the work necessary to move those utilities are contained within the channel construction uh, item here at 34 million. Uh, moving down to other mitigation projects, this is where you see the upstream JPA settlement for the economic relief fund, uh, as well as additional um, uh, wetland and uh, environmental restoration work uh, necessary for the Oxbow Hickson Baki um, project, as well as the uh, the remainder of the uh, the levee system there. Moving down to in-town flood protection projects. Uh, oh, can move back, there we go. Um, we see that budget of 35 million. Um, that's really taking care of uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the in-town work uh, necessary within the city of Fargo and a large number of the uh, River Stage 37 projects um, that are anticipated. Um, move down to the next page, please. Uh, our land acquisition and mitigation budget, similar to this last year, um, budget of 69 million. Uh, you can see uh, management, legal, financial procurement. That includes uh, anticipated costs for uh, last resort eminent domain actions, as well as uh, keeping our lands program moving forward with both flowage easements and property acquisition necessary for the, uh, the southern embankment construction. Uh, moving down to engineering and design fees, um, you can see what we're lower than we were uh, in 2020. I would estimate that to can, you know, continue to uh, level off here as we move in the P3 uh, construction. Uh, all of that design engineering work is uh, complete and uh, really we're focused on working kind or engineering related to the core projects. We lost our, uh, oh, there we go. Um, the final area, the program management, um, you can see we have a $12 million budget. Uh, similar PMC related functions moving into next year as we had this year. Um, you know, nothing of, of major significance um, that that's changing uh, really between this year and next year. Uh, just a note, in 2020, um, you can see we ran a, our PMC budget, um, you know, uh, quite a bit lower than anticipated. Uh, I do believe some of that was a result of efficiencies gained um, as we brought um, DA staff on board. Um, and so, you know, we anticipate that to continue to move forward um, into the future. So, um, uh, one item, one more item to note, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, the debt service component you can see has substantially been reduced uh, between what we had anticipated in 19 and 20. Uh, and that's uh, cert that's a result of uh, lower interest rate environment on, on some of our debt service. Uh, and so we are uh, realizing some savings um, from that aspect as well. So. Uh, with that, I will entertain any uh, questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Is there any questions for the committee? Joel, you showed us a lot of information, but sometimes when Martin talks about quarter financial plan, you now are showing us some savings. And I remember when we had Oak Grove come on that added cost, different costs. I don't know how you would show this, but Rick Steen will probably know the magic to do this, but it would appear in some ways you've got some cost savings that we we're realizing, but does that overall change uh, when, you know, if we said we had so much in expenses we expected in 2020, again, 2021, it looks like we're getting some cost savings as well. So there's a lot of data that you put forth to this. How would we ever gauge that uh, of uh, maybe we're ahead of it? Because I know we have a lot of contingency, but what if, what if we're getting a little ahead of some of this stuff? Wouldn't we have less we would need as far as from the state? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor Mahoney. I think that's a good observation. And um, for us, it's somewhat of a moving target. Uh, you know, uh, as you're, you're aware, we're tracking a number of uh, 
you know, potential cost increases as well, and we're managing those as we move along. Um, I think it's encouraging that uh, we're finding cost savings in a number of different areas. Um, you know, really the, the, the big unknown at this point is uh, what our P3 bids are going to be. And uh, that's really going to determine the certainty moving forward. Once we get those P3 bids, we'll pull the crank on our financial plan um, and we'll come back to the finance committee with a, a, a lot of certainty and we can show those cost savings. We can show where we're at and uh, we're really locking in our, our uh, and minimizing our risk at that point. Um, and so we'll continue to obviously track pluses and minuses as we go along. And I think it's been encouraging over this last year that we found a lot more minuses than pluses. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the, the, the big question mark is, is what, where we're going to be sitting once we get those P3 bids in hand. This is, this is Steen. Yes, Rick. Thank you. Uh, good question, Mayor Mahoney. Um, I agree with Joel. It's going to be almost impossible to find out where we're really at until we get those the P3 bids out there, and then we can probably lay out a, a schedule that we're more accustomed to and say, here's our estimated completion, you know, cost versus what we assumed at one point in time. And that's even more complicated because it's more of a finance plan, not just a period in time cost. And so it gets very complicated to do that. Um, so anyway, I agree with, with Joel's comments on that. The one the one question I would have, Joel, on this is we talked about when we approved this, I can't remember what word you used. It was very good though, financial mitigation plan or something for the for the um, upstream uh, group and, and the Buffalo White Red. We talked about the fact that we have costs that were already anticipated that would you know we'd be paying for with the 35 million. I mean, I remember that discussion very clearly. This isn't 35 million, it's something less because we always contemplated that. And so at one point in time, perhaps the next meeting, it'd be nice to find out in, in true fashion what in fact our budget changed because some of these costs were now they're all rolled up into uh, this mitigation $35 million cost, which means to me some of the other costs should have gone down by substantial amounts based upon that discussion we had earlier. So it'd be nice to see that uh, at some type of presentation formatted in January. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Steen. I, I think we can easily pull that together, um, you know, and, and that's in the context of what we're looking at here. Uh, as you know, you know, we're looking at a year by year cash budget, but this is not the overall, um, you know, budget estimate for the, the, the project itself. And that further gets complicated in that we have a capital budget and we also have a long term financial plan. Um, and so there, there's some nuances, but I think we could present the information to show uh, how that economic relief fund payment plays into our overall ultimate mitigation budget. Um, and, and you're right, the conversations we've had before is we were able to find uh, enough room in our mitigation budget to accommodate that, um, that uh, economic relief fund um, without having to increase the the uh, capital uh, budget of the diversion authority and and so we can lay that all out in january give you a brief update on on where we're sitting with that that'd be great thanks yep as been discussed uh, obviously the year 2021 is going to be different in the sense of the amount of dollars uh, that are going to be expended as we continue to move forward uh, Joel, could you address with regard to uh, program management or whatever, a staffing uh, perspective or uh, what your thoughts are on that? Obviously, we're under discussion right now for a uh, uh, finance director, but uh, what other additional staffing needs or support staff do you project for 2021? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Dardis. Um, you know, you mentioned the finance director. Of course, that's going to be uh, an, uh, a very important part of our executive leadership team that we have uh, with the DA. Um, most of the support uh, uh, functions of the finance director are being performed by member entity staff, uh, as well as the PMC uh, and consult and, and other consultants uh, on said Twitchell. 
Um, we hope to centralize a lot of those duties uh, into a public role uh, under the finance director. Um, and we, we see a lot of value in getting that position filled. Uh, another position that uh, Mr. Bakigard and I have talked about uh, more on the um, implementation and engineering side is, uh, is a compliance officer. Um, as we move into construction and we execute the P3 agreement, as well as the plethora of memorandum of understandings that we have with various entities. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of compliance points that we need to meet. Uh, and we do need uh, active control over those compliance points to ensure the integrity and credibility of our organization moving forward and that we're meeting all of the obligations that we're agreeing to within these documents and, and within these agreements. Um, that, ver that, that, that should be, in my mind, a internal uh, public side staff function. Um, and so we would be looking at bringing in somebody under Mr. Bakigard um, that would be focused on uh, that activity in conjunction with the PMC, who of course we've hired to um, manage the overall compliance of the P3 um, project and, and uh, implementation. Um, you know, you can see here between 2020 and 2021, you know, a similar budget for the PMC. What's actually happening behind the scenes is we're transitioning a lot of employees from a, a P3 procurement focus into a P3 pro, uh, implementation focus. And so you're not seeing a high level budget change, but what you are going to see is you're going to see some additional staff uh, leaving from the PMC and new staff coming in that have the expertise in implementation versus procurement of a P3 project. Um, other than that, I think that's that's probably where uh, you, you know we'll be sitting as far as internal staff for the DA uh, next year and, and what our needs are. Um, however, I'd, I'd caveat that just a just a hair. I do think uh, bringing on. Uh, our communications director, and, and she's been on the job now for a month and a half. Um, obviously, uh, there there um, may be some ability to bring on a support staff member for her on the public side to assist in managing public outreach and external and internal communication processes and protocols. Uh, other than that, I wouldn't anticipate uh, any uh, additional needs. I think once we begin construction, we're going to have um, more clarity and roles and responsibilities as those uh, those get ironed out. Um, but at the moment, that would be my anticipated uh, view for 2021. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Is there any additional questions of Mr. Paulson on the cash financial budget? Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Bernie. Yes. Sir. Joel, the only question I have is, that, and this will happen, I know, as we go along with new programs, is that at one point we need Jacobs, we need, uh, we needed that team to help us with exactly what you're talking is compliance and some of those different issues. And it was cited that we needed this outside big company to help us because none of us had done really a P3, and there's multiple moving parts, blah blah blah, of how do, how you track compliance and track everything else. It seems like as you're going along now, you're starting to be able to now retransition back into local and um you know maybe we need a discussion of you know how does jacob style fit with the organization once p3 bit is done i just think uh it might be helpful for the leadership just to understand initially there were quote responsibilities and duties we expected out of our consultants and it seems now we're shifting a little bit back the other direction so i i think it would be helpful for the team it's almost like we had some ideas of what this group was offering us, but then now it seems like we, we're trying to reshift that back local. I'm not disagreeing with tactics where we're headed, but just curious about um, uh, who does what where, and because you're getting rid of what we would call a higher level of scrutiny, and then we're bringing it all in house. And um, uh, just curious about that as you set your budget for 21. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. I, I think that's a unique insight as well and something that we need to deal with. Um, I would say, uh, you know, presenting the board and, and finance committee 
you know, structure of what it looks like during implementation and how we're changing from procurement to implementation would certainly be extremely beneficial and just getting alignment and uh, in understanding the functions uh, moving forward. The uh, Jacobs uh, has carved out, um, you know, some roles and responsibilities for local consultants that should be done at the local level. Doesn't require national or international expertise as we uh, move into monitoring and compliance of the P3 construction. Uh, and we will be moving forward with uh, filling those roles and um, uh, acquiring, a, you know, a, some additional consultant um, uh, individuals to to cover those roles. Overall, however, the, you know, we we continue to have the underlying um, roles and responsibilities and duties of the program management consultant, um, you know, and how they uh, track in, and 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 uh, monitor document control, uh, invoice control, finance control. Uh, there's a number of different functions that we rely on on a day-to-day -day basis with the with the uh, program uh, management consultant that will continue in you know through the duration of uh, of the project and so I, I do think presenting an overall structure and and allowing committee members and board members to ask questions and gain understanding um, to what this will look like is a is a very uh, valuable exercise we could go through. Uh, in the upcoming months here. Additional questions for Mr. Paulson. Would you address the revenue sources on the final page a little bit, Joel? Yes, absolutely, Mr. Chair. So this is the revenues uh, and the sources that support the cash budget for 2021. I'll just go through them quickly. We have uh, anticipate 32 million from the sales tax uh, from the city of Fargo. 16 million from the sales tax from Cass County, 100, uh, almost 110 million of uh, state uh, water commission dollars coming from the state, North, state of North Dakota. Um, and then we have investment income uh, on our cash reserves of 200,000. Uh, and we have property income from our asset lands at 500,000. Uh, and then, of course, we're utilizing, as, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, um, when Kent mentioned we're at, uh, I believe it was $119 million in cash, we're utilizing $61 million of that uh, out of our cash reserves um, to support that cash budget. On your property income, uh, I, was, I partake, partook in the uh, Land Management uh, Committee meeting earlier today is uh, that property income, is that from uh, uh, producers that were leasing land back to? That is correct, uh, Chairman Dardis. And that will change as we move forward because once the, uh, once the construction starts, uh, some of those land leases will um, you know, dwindle in, in comparison to the property necessary for construction. Um, and, and so we're anticipating 500,000 for next year. That is down from what we received in 2020 due to the fact that we're restricting the types of crops that producers can grow um, within the, uh, the right-of-way limits of the diversion channel um, in an effort to ensure that they can get their crops off uh, prior to disturbance from the P3 developer. So in the lease agreements, you're uh, it's reference that they uh, must produce small grains. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any additional questions for Mr. Paulson on the 2021 cash budget? Hearing none. Commissioners, could I have a, a motion, please? Peterson motion. Thank you. Is there a second, please? Steen seconds. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the 2021 cash budget as presented and distributed. Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Dr. Mahoney. Mr. Peterson? Yes, for Mahoney. Yeah. Mr. 
Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montplaisir. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Steen. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Tim, do you still have a question? You got your hand up. No, I'll, I'll try to take it down. Mayor Mahoney, thank you. If you recall at the beginning of the meeting, I asked that the, move, uh, the compensation study be moved to the next order of business. So with that said, uh, the compensation study, uh, Joel Peterson Paulson. Thank you, Mayor, or thank you, Chairman Dardis. Uh, this, is, this would be a contract to get a, a consultant moving forward um, on a classification and compensation study for internal positions within the diversion authority. Um, this is, uh, I think, a necessity for us moving forward um, in order to uh, justify and um, clarify the roles of the Diversion Authority employees and additional folks that we uh, may bring on, uh, as previously mentioned in the cash budget discussion. Uh, we're looking at filling some additional roles. Um, this, this study will compare the Diversion Authority project to um, similar comparable um, authorities and entities um, in an effort to be able to, um, you know, create a uh, pay matrix and classification of employees. Um, this will assist us moving forward in, um, uh, you know, annual performance reviews, um, as well as ensuring that the roles and responsibilities of the uh, public employees fit within um, the uh, uh, you know the justified pay range um, for the uh, for the diversion authority uh, so so with that I'll take any uh, questions or comments uh, related but I, I would recommend approval and moving forward with this thank you mr. Paulson are there any questions with regard to the Gallagher study this is Steen uh, mr. Steen thank you Chairman, uh, Joel, I think this is a good move on your part. I mean, I know there's been some discussion about how much should we pay, what's reasonable, what's you know, I, and to stay within line and and provide, I think the the diversion authority some guidance with what we're hiring people at, the rates we're hiring people at. So I'm all in favor of this. The the only concern I have, Joel, is is this de delay your hiring of the finance director by too long of a shot. I know you've had some discussions on that. I know you've got some ranges you could use. Uh, prior to having a completion of the study, I just want your take on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Steen. I think that's a good question. Uh, we still, uh, I think we can work these two in parallel. Um, so I, I think we're going to re-advertise the finance director uh, position. Um, and I think as we move forward, uh, the, the hiring of the finance director could hopefully coincide with the um, approval and implementation of this class comp study. Um, so I, I don't think it will hinder us. I, I think we'll uh, we'll move in tandem and uh, uh, hopefully at the end of the day, we're hiring the finance director within this uh, pay matrix and classification study. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any questions, additional questions for Mr. Paulson? Mr. Chair. Yes, please. I have a, a, I'd like to move to uh, authorize approval of the compensation study to be conducted by Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Is there a second, please? Jacobson, second. Thank you, Dan. It's been moved and seconded to approve uh, the uh, contract with Gallagher for the uh, appraisal oh. of the finance director. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Don, would you please call the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montplaisir. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Mr. Steen? Yes. Ms. McCall? Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Next Mr. order Chair. of business. Mr. Chair, yes, excuse please, me for Mr. interrupting. 
I just I inform you I have to excuse myself from the meeting meeting at this time. All thank right, you thank much. you, Mr. Steen. Uh, next order of business is uh, with you a loan update, Mr. Shockley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was having some trouble coming off of mute. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, I was just going to give a brief uh, pre presentation um, uh, regarding uh, this matter. Uh, I had previously given uh, this presentation to the uh, uh, EPA WIFIA uh, leadership. And I think it does a very nice job of providing an overview of how the WIFIA loan will work, along with some of the payments that are due under the P3 agreement. And when I had shared it with a kind of a work group, internal work group that we have with a couple of the board members, uh, the discussion was that it would be good to share it with the group. Uh, so <clears throat> Maybe some very high level basics. Uh, this is uh, this presentation was intended to provide an uh, overview of how uh, um, how uh, how we were going to be uh, presenting uh, and drawing from the WIFI alone. So the the first part of the process is that we divided uh, the payments for the WIFI loan up over the course of four quarters, much like a football uh, game. Uh, and you'll see uh, the investment of the developer uh, is, and did it, did it advance to the second screen? I wanna make sure that this is working correctly. No, it did not. Oh, um, how about now? We're just seeing your uh, cover sheet. Cover okay. sheet. Now, yep. How now we're on the. Now we're on the fourth sheet. Okay. There. How about now? Yep. There you're. You're on number two now, John. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm still uh, getting the hang of this virtual technology. So, uh, with respect to the WIFI loan, we divided up the draws of the WIFI loan over four quarters, and we're anticipating. And these are just draft dates. Uh, so we would award the P3 contract on April 22nd, and we're anticipating that contract will close on uh, September 30th of 2021. It may close slightly earlier, but we just we wanted to use this as an example. So we divided up in the four quarters with the fourth quarter ending on May 31st of 2027. Uh, that's the expected date that the developer would deliver uh, and the authority would agree that the project is substantially complete so that it can provide flood protection uh, in year 2028. And so you'll see uh, this orange, there's the orange color, that's the developer's equity. And then you have this yellow color is the uh, amount of uh, loan that the developer has obtained, private financing that they're putting into the project. Uh, by quarter two, they're still using up all of their own funds. Uh, the authority has not drawn or paid them any funds. So all of the construction that is going through the first quarter is all being uh, paid for out of the developer's pocket. Uh, then you'll start seeing in quarter two, uh, that's when we start thinking about uh, drawing on a loan. Uh, and so we have, at this point in time, we have the developer's uh, private equity uh, we have a little bit of uh, their loan. They're still running up their loan. And then this blue chunk is some of the SRF financing. So we have about $81 million of SRF financing. Uh, by quarter three, you'll see we've drawn 53% of the WIFI loan. And then you start to see the pie chart sort of balance out again. Uh, and then by quarter four, we've drawn 100% of the WIFI loan where you'll see that the WIFI alone makes up uh, about a quarter of the pie. Uh, the other authority funding, which could also include some cash uh, payments, uh, the developers, private equity, and then their uh, private loan. So why is this important? I think that this sheet does a really nice job of explaining uh, how a P3 works and why it's valuable to an owner. 
you'll see at financial close, uh, we set uh, three lines. Uh, the first is the amount of financing and equity that's committed by the developer. Uh, and this is that orange line and you'll see it sits slightly above 400, uh, about 426 million to about 450 million of private loans and equity. And so for the first quarter, they're largely burning through their funds. And we start this blue line is the total capital that's being put into the project. And so this is actual dollars in the ground. It could be uh, engineering fees that they're expending. It could be concrete they're pouring, could be diesel. Uh, through quarter two, they continue spending all of their own money. And so it's not until quarter two that we reach this crossover point at which the authority starts putting money in. And it's an easy way to think about it from the authority's perspective is we're sort of the uh, senior partner uh, our money comes in last, uh, so they've already invested their money, and then we start bringing in our funds. And so you'll see the lines between the WIFI loan draw, which is green, and then the overall CapEx spending for the project are very, uh, very close, closely aligned. Uh, and uh, it's there's some bumps in it, which the difference is just the SRF loans and a little bit of the cost uh, that uh, is incurred that we're paying for uh, by ourselves or uh, with cash on hand. Um, and then this private equity portion over time, this gets repaid through the AP payments. And so the final slide is another way to look at those lines. And so you'll see the total capital expenditures on the project as it's, as it's being built. Uh, we're estimating by the time you reach uh, completion, it'll be about 1.2. Uh, billion and over time you can see our uh, the total draws from the uh, WIFI loan reach 561 million. You'll wonder why it says 561 when our loan is actually 569. The, uh, the difference is that we're funding the reserve fund through that extra 8 million and then these red red portions on the chart represent the draws of the WIFI loan uh, and the quarters match up to the time. And uh, I, I think this makes a nice a visual representation of how the financing from a very, very high level works uh, with respect to the P3 project. Um, and it also, I think it drives home the fact that the authority has some security in this because we're making the developers spend their money first. And then once we reach substantial completion, we start repaying their private debt and equity through AP payments. And then five years after that, we start payments on the WIFI alone. Um, so I can certainly answer any questions, um, but I uh, wanted to just give you an opportunity to uh, see at a very high level how the financing process works. Thank you, Mr. Shockley. Are there any questions of Mr. Shockley? John, if you'd put your last slide up, it shows the full cost of the P3, what, 1.2 billion. And then if I subtract out what we put in the WIFIA 561, a legislative person, it might look like we only have 646 to make up million. I'm just uh, curious how you think their minds will look at that uh, that blue line going to your green line. Is, is that, <clears throat> quote, what the state has to fund? And I know it's more complex than that, but just trying to look at it simplistically that if a legislative person looks at it, they might think that we only have to find 646. So uh, going back to sort of the accountant's view of the world, this is just our expenditures. This isn't re our revenue side. This is right. how much money the authority is putting out the door. On the revenue side, we have to repay the WIFI loan, this 561 with yep. uh, our local sales tax. Uh, the SRF bonds are being repaid with the local sales tax, uh, as are the AP payments being repaid with the local sales tax. And so we still have many other, uh, you know, either 2.75 billion of the project minus the 1.2 uh, for the developer. That's really what we need uh, from the state and from the federal government. Good explanation. Thanks, John. Additional questions for Mr. Shockley?
All right. Thank you, Mr. Shockey. The visuals were exceptional. Thank you. Next order of business is the uh, approval of MOUs and agreement actions. Mr. Shockley. So I have uh, uh, quite a number of approvals uh, and I, I apologize for the length of the documents and the amount of documents, but in the project we are reaching what I like to refer to as the end of, at the light of the tunnel. Uh, there's approximately 30 some uh, utilities, uh, probably eight or nine township MOUs. Uh, there's MOUs with other agencies, like next month you'll see an MOU with West Fargo. Um, there's MOUs with Cass County. There's MOUs with North Dakota DOT. There's uh, MOUs with Horace. And so there's a lot of these, what we refer to as third party agreements that are going to be on the board's agenda over the next uh, two to three to four months, depending as, as they're being finalized. Uh, at a very high level, I would note that these, uh, pr these agreements and the costs that are included with them have largely been accounted for in the cost estimate that was performed by Jacobs as part of their cost estimating process they went through and looked at how much the utility relocates would cost, uh, how much some of the other uh, project features would cost that would be contemplated in these agreements. And so, and maybe one other high level point, this is a little bit different than your standard project uh, where it's a design bid build uh, project. Oftentimes cities and counties will, will prepare the plans and specs, they'll bid it out and then after the fact, uh, you'll start entering into agreements with utilities to relocate the utilities. And so you have uh, the cost estimates for the political subdivision aren't necessarily inclusive of some of these other third party costs. In the P3 world, all of these costs get accelerated to the front. And so there's more visibility, uh, but from the political subdivision standpoint, you know what your costs are going into the transaction. And so recognize, uh, recognizing everybody's time, uh, the first uh, MOU is a MOU with Cass County and it's regarding the diversion channel project. Um, and there's a nice summary of what it is. It's a cost reimbursement for related costs and expenses. So there are many county roads that connect up to the county bridges there's relocations, uh, there's costs that are from the being born by the county for both design, engineering, access, uh, construction, uh, and some reimbursement of costs by the county and also long-term maintenance issues. Um, I can answer any specific questions you might have about it, uh, but this is, my understanding is this has been approved by the Cass County Commission. And so the last step in the process is through the diversion authority to approve it. Any questions for Mr. Shockley on the Cass County MOU? So Mr. do we Chair, want to take a motion? I'm sorry, yeah, we'll take them one at a time. May I have a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, motion to approve, Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, and second. Do we have a uh, second? Please. Second. Thank you, been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion on the Cass County MOU? Hearing none, Don, would you please read the roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Aye. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Coston. Yes. Mr. Montplaisir. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. The next order is the uh, North Dakota DOT MOU for I-29. Mr. Shockley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. Uh, this is a uh, MOU that we've been working with uh, North Dakota DOT and Army Corps of Engineers uh, for almost nine months. Uh, and this is in regards to the I-29 road raise project. Uh, it is a reimbursement for North Dakota T DOT staff 
uh, for their review of designs, uh, engineering costs, acquisition, construction, and probably more importantly is inspection services and long-term O&M uh, because the, the interesting part about this project is that the authority will ultimately control what's underneath the interstate and which seems simple at first uh, but when you start thinking about it how do you maintain flood protection that has an interstate that goes up and over it along with a bridge and so the MOU uh, took some time to develop and it also includes an attachment to it that's referred to as an Army Corps of Engineers uh, memorandum for record uh, that contains the the requirements and the obligations of the Army Corps of Engineers. Can certainly answer any questions that you may have about it. Um, it it got very detailed because it, there's some complexity in the relationship of the parties. Thank you, Mr. Shockley. Is there any other questions for Mr. Shockley regarding the North Dakota DOT MOU? Any questions? Would move to approve all the MOUs unless one particular member has a question on any one of the MOUs. You're moving for all 10 of the items to be approved, Mayor? Yes, yes I am. I'm assuming John did his work. All right. All right. It's been moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? This is Hendrickson, I'll second it. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded to approve items one through 10 uh, on the uh, approval of the MOU agreements and actions as uh, outlined by Mr. Shockley. Is there any further discussion on doing all 10 of these at once? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can we ask Mr. Shackley if there's anything of, of nuance that needs to be discussed regarding the remaining? Thank, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Shockley. Um, no, I think maybe the only, uh, I wouldn't say nuance, but just for awareness for the board's uh, uh, understanding is the MOU with the city of Mapleton. When the project was originally contemplated, uh, it was it preceded the time that the city of West Fargo hooked up to the uh, uh, city of Fargo's sewer system. And as that uh, the regional uh, sewer system uh, has become larger and more communities like Horus are joining on, Mapleton expressed an interest to connect on to West Fargo system, which would then dump into Fargo system. So as a result, it makes sense to have the city of Mapleton oh work with the diversion to route the uh, force main for their sanitary sewer services uh, under the diversion oh. or over the diversion, uh, depending upon the, uh, how the engineer set it up. And so it is a slight, it is a slight change, um, but I think that was, I think we had contemplated uh, some of these additional potential costs in the cost estimate so it's just, i just draw your attention to it that it was probably something that wasn't originally contemplated uh when the project was originally being planned and it's just a function of uh, the phenomenal growth in the regionalization of sanitary sewer services thank you mr shockley are there any others that you'd like to address john no i think the other ones are are very straightforward I'll have to admit to the committee, I read six of these and I couldn't uh, take it anymore. So I, I stopped and the maple tone was one I did read. So uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor to approve uh, the 10 MOUs as presented today. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Don, will you please call a roll? Mayor Dardis. Yes. Dr. Mahoney. Hi. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Hendrickson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Costin. Yes. Mr. Montpleasure. Yes. Mr. Redlinger. Yes. Ms. McCall. Yes. That is everyone. Thank you, Don. Uh, motion passes. 
Uh, next order of business is asset land policy. Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Chairman Dardis. And uh, this, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know we've gone over our allocated time here, obviously uh, all important items. Uh, and this is as well. This is a draft policy that I worked with Mr. Shockley, Mr. Nicholson and Mr. Dodds on. And it really addresses how we're going to manage and um, potentially ultimately dispose of asset lands outside of the right of way that we do not need for the construction of the project. And for the Finance Committee's context, uh, we have uh, approaching or just over 20 million in uh, uh, acreage in farmland that, uh, that we currently own and we're currently managing through land leases um, that, are, that is not necessary for the construction of the project. Uh, most of these parcels were acquired um, by landowners that were impacted by the project. Um, some of them wished to uh, sell additional land so that they didn't have an obtuse uh, parcel or a smaller parcel. Uh, some folks chose to just get out of agriculture altogether as part of the um, uh, agreement with the Cass County Joint to purchase a majority of their lands. Uh, and so we have bits and pieces along the entire channel and, and portions along the southern embankment uh, that the Cass County Joint Board currently owns and is holding on behalf of the Diversion Authority. Uh, this uh, issue has been touched by the mitigation plan, um, but uh, before we move forward with any sort of formal um, actions with this property, we wanted to get the input of the Lands Committee and the Finance Committee and develop a policy that would direct our actions and how we dispose of the property or own and maintain and manage the property. Uh, so this is this is the draft policy. I wish to get some uh, input from the Finance Committee. I know this is the first time you're seeing it, but I wanted to go over it and hopefully get, gather that uh, input from the Finance Committee over the course of the next month and bring a formal policy to the board uh, in January for action. Um, and so if we could just move down to the guts of the policy um, and I'll explain uh, uh, what we're proposing at the moment. Under 4.1 key principles, uh, the first, I, I think, um, policy issue we'd like to propose uh, and get feedback on would be land sold via public sale. Um, so we're recommending that any land that is disposed of that is not necessary for the project would be sold as a public sale, uh, either listing or auction, um, and make that available to anybody or any entity that um, so chooses to uh, make an offer on, on that property. Uh, the second item would be refrain from selling land at a loss. Uh, this has a few nuances to it because uh, some of the land that we've purchased, uh, we purchased in large tracts. Um, we've needed to subdivide that into uh, land with obtuse angles uh, that makes it uh, more difficult to farm. Uh, obviously, uh, some impact and loss of value on the property. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, our appraisal on the property and what the value of that is, is what we're really looking for here. Um, in selling land at market value um, and not giving land away or selling it at a loss. Uh, item number 4.3 would be preference to sell farmland to adjacent property owners. Um, so giving them the first option to make a bid on the on the land. Again, we, we would require that the bid on the land would be equivalent to uh, a market value price. Um, but really allowing adjacent landowners to have uh, um, the, the ability to negotiate uh, first before it goes to a public auction or listed as a public land sale. Item 4.4 would be our wish to keep these parcels taxable. Uh, so even if the Cass County Joint kept the property uh, in perpetuity on, for the benefit of the diversion, we would, uh, we would want to continue to pay property taxes uh, on that land. Uh, if it was sold, obviously we can't um, uh, mandate that it'll be taxable forever if another public entity were to purchase it and use it for a public good. Um, but our preference would be to keep the, the parcels taxable. Item number 4.5 would be an option to hold certain land long-term. 
Uh, we ran a number of analysis and there's property uh, within the, uh, the mitigation area uh, that we currently own uh, and possibly some in the future that we could potentially purchase uh, that would be a financially beneficial uh, purchase for the diversion authority. And I'll just do a quick scenario. Uh, we own some land uh, that's right adjacent to the southern embankment on the unprotected side uh, that we we purchased uh, that had development potential. Uh, and so we purchased that property for, uh, let's just say for, for the sake of this uh, example, $14,000 an acre. A uh, typical egg property that we're purchasing is anywhere between five and six thousand. Once the project is implemented, that land would be worth five or six thousand or whatever the going market rate would be for egg property. However, we're required to put a flowage easement on that property, and that flowage easement would would be calculated as an appraisal of what the property would be without the project in place, uh, the fourteen thousand dollars per acre. So we have the potential where there's some property along the southern embankment that's probably most impacted by our um, our retention area that the flow easement could be worth more than what the, the property is is uh, will be valued at after the project is in place. Uh, not only that, but there's a higher risk for prevent plant and summertime crop loss insurance payouts. Uh, for some of the property that's directly adjacent to the southern embankment. So with all those risk uh, considerations and value considerations, there is a real argument to be made that it'd be financially more um, advantageous to the diversion authority to retain and manage some of that property long term. We wanted the options to be able to do that through this policy directive. Uh, and so with that, I guess I'm not necessarily asking for any in-depth discussion today. Uh, I did present this at the lands committee. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback, uh, a lot of support for um, these items. And uh, we've asked the land committee to do uh, the same as the finance and, and be able to uh, take this and, um, and discuss it and come back next month with a formal policy that uh, both lands and finance could recommend for approval with the DA board. Uh, so with that, I'll take any questions uh, if there are any, but I'm not asking any formal action uh, tonight. Um, Mr. Paulson, with regard to the, the example that you used, throughout the footprint, how many acres are we talking that we would keep in for uh, future development? Uh, so idea, I'll probably rely on Mr. Dodds. It would really be the land located in the, uh, the mitigation area. So as you can see, we own some parcels in what we refer to as the camel hump area at the moment. Um, there more than likely will be some additional, uh, remnant parcels that are purchased as we purchase the land necessary for the construction. Um, this this is really the area where that the flexibility to uh, keep and lease that land would prevent us from having to have uh, crop insurance and prevent plant policies on those parcels. Uh, and really, these are the the, the riskiest areas uh, or ones that are at greatest risk of uh, invoking um, you know a a prevent plant or summertime crop loss uh, payment. Um, and so, Eric, I don't know if you know how much land we currently own there and what might be anticipated. Hi, Joel and uh, Mayor Dardis. Right now, you can see on the map showing those are the, the highlighted parcels are the parcels that we own and we're considering some type of asset, meaning that we own more property rights than what we need. Um, we've had a lot of discussions, as Joel just mentioned, in the camel hump area. It, it may be advantageous for us to purchase that land in fee title um, to limit the agricultural risks. Um, a lot of that land is going to be valued somewhere greater than raw ag land. In, in fact, probably quite a bit higher than raw ag land. And so we need, at a minimum, we need to pay for the development rights. And so the flow easement price will be approaching the value of fee title. 
And so I think that as the analysis I've done on this, I, I feel like it makes good financial sense to be buying that land in, in fee title. Plus, uh, we could avoid having the backside risk of, you know, more regular uh, crop damage issues um, arise in that area. So, well, it, it, and I just want to note, uh, Mr. Chair, we're not proposing any sort of eminent domain here by any means, nor do we have the authority to do that. Um, so it would have to be a willing seller uh, and the DA would be a willing buyer uh, and the financial uh, analysis would have to support the benefit to the DA, um, you know, both now and long term. Moving forward, looking at the 2021 cash budget, obviously, uh, where the expenditures for next year at 219 million are substantially greater than what we've been doing. And, and of course, as you stated, we have about uh, 20 million in uh, assets of, of land. Uh, and uh, I'm just looking at that overall uh, dollar figure as to if we, if, if we don't need this land and uh, the farmers would like to buy it back, uh, you know, uh, I'm an advocate to turning it to cash is what I'm saying. So I, I certainly understand, uh, you know, the intricacies of this and, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness that you put in the, uh, the asset land policy. That's uh, it's a, it's a great document. And uh, the land group earlier today had some very thoughtful and heartfelt comments with regard to uh, making sure that the existing producers have uh, you know first refusal and all of those types of things so at the same time when i'm talking about the financial element of it uh, that's a very sensitive issue to uh, many of the board members and uh, you know so the document is well thought out it's the only point i want to make so you're not looking for an action item on this today joel you're uh, come back to us at a later date this is information only that's correct and i'll have the policy sent out to all the finance committee members uh, feel free to engage in email or verbal discussions as you may as you review it and uh, think about uh, comments related to to the policy and we'll bring the formal policy uh, back in january all right is there any additional questions for mr paulson with regard to the proposed asset land policy that we're uh, discussing All right, we'll move on. Uh, the next order of business is the 2021 Fargo Moorhead Diversion Authority public meeting calendar. And Jennifer? Chair, Chairman Darvis, if I may, yep. uh, I do have to leave the meeting. I have a presentation at 520 for uh, some legislators. Um, so if there's any additional questions throughout the meeting for me, um, I'll, I'll refer uh, those questions to uh, the Deputy Executive Director, Martin Nicholson. Thank you very much, Mr. Paulson. Again, we're at the on the 2021 Fargo Moorhead Diversion Authority public meetings calendar. And Jennifer, yes. Do you have anything that you'd like to say about the calendar? So, uh, not at the moment. We're looking at adjusting the calendar, but not for this time all right thank you jennifer thank there's you. been some discussion on the various committee groups with regard to i know that uh commissioner Sherling is talking about with land acquisition that they may be possibly uh going to uh meetings quarterly or whatever uh, there's also been discussions with regard to the finance committee that uh, we may have to have uh, a few more meetings due to the fact of what's transpiring in 2021. So uh, this is a calendar of the public meetings that is uh, on the docket at this time, but uh, we'll uh, obviously react as needed as we continue to move forward in 2021. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Next order of business is the property acquisition status report. Mr. Dodds. Good evening, Chairman, committee members. In your packet, as usual, you see the uh, monthly status report. Um, just a few things to point out. Uh, Peggy, if you can go to the next page. Um, the next page just 
I'd like to focus on this. You, you see the color coding. Oh, I'm sorry, Peggy, go back to the, there you go, thank you. Um, you can see the color coding status of all the acquisitions. We are continuing to make progress, sort of slow and steady progress. However, if, if you have a keen eye and a good memory, you might recall that last month um, we had about 420 parcels acquired. This month under the green category, there's 485. And so there's a pretty significant jump. Uh, some of that is progress made on parcels acquired. Some of it is due to parcel splits. Uh, where we still own the same land, but it's been split into two or maybe even three chunks. And so we're we're sort of uh, counting all those asset lands as we split them off and getting prepared to turn that land over to the contractors. The other thing you might notice is there's a growing number of red colored parcels. Those are parcels that we have acquired via quick take or last resort eminent domain. Uh, unfortunately, some of those negotiations just haven't reached a voluntary settlement, and so we've been through the statutory process, going through the county commission and getting approval to file those eminent domain actions. At the time of this report, you can see there were 39 parcels. Um, unfortunately, by the time this report gets produced for next month, there will be a growing number of those, but uh, that's been determined to be a necessary step to get the land rights in hand for construction. I want to assure all of you that we are trying to continue to negotiate towards a voluntary settlement on those as we move forward. So uh, with that, I guess I would just pause and if there's any questions, happy to answer those. Otherwise, uh, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Dodds. Are there any questions from Mr. Dodds? On property acquisition status. All right, thank you. The next meeting will be January 27th. Uh, I would like to thank the committee for their patience this evening. We're running a little long and uh, you've been great and I appreciate that very much. Also would like to extend uh, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you.